Looks good. Okay, welcome everyone to our monthly meeting of the ESIP Semantic Technology Committee. Today is a great honor. We have uh, Sarah Maxon from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to give us a talk on Link ML and also the application of Link ML in data integration. We will record uh, her talk and also the QA session and share it later on our EC uh, YouTube channel. Um, so to save some time, I will just give the floor to Sarah uh, for right. your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction and also the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I, my name is Sierra and I am from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. My background is really in biology and computer science. I've spent my career, you know, the last couple of decades modeling and transforming and working with data, developing software for various websites for biomedical and biological data. And I'm really excited to talk today about a tool we're developing called LinkML. It's short for the Linked Data Modeling Framework. It's a series of tools and a language to help us harmonize data across our domain. And sort of to, you know, set the stage here. Oops, there we go. I think all of us on this call would just be really happy and thrilled if all of our data just looked like this. <laughs> you know, if we're really shooting for the moon, if everyone just used integers, we'd be really happy. We'd have clearly labeled attributes and whole numbers. Um, our data would be really easy, easy to compare and easy to, to, to digest and ingest. But um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your <laughs> point of view, biomedical and biological data is really complex. We have a lot of relational information with thousands of named entities from everything from the smallest molecule all the way up to the, the largest biome of the earth and beyond. Um, and we have thousands of named entities and quite frankly, most of our knowledge really still exists in unstructured formats like literature or figures, lab notebooks, even spreadsheets are kind of a min minimally formatted form of data that we see. One of the projects I work on is the National Microbiome Data Collaborative and this is an example from a real world data set that we just <clears throat> were working on ingesting. And you can see it's made up of a really wide and sparse table where a lot of the null values you have to kind of decide as a human, are they supposed to be null? Was there a data problem in entering this data or are they null based on some other field in the row um, on intentionally? There are often no validators, unclear semantics about the column headers, of course, a lot of free text categorical information that's not necessarily consistent through the data set. And really what it gets down to is that <clears throat> often the consumers, as we all know of data, aren't the same people that captured or recorded the data. So there's this interpretation that has to be done both temporally and spatially disparate from the generation. And oftentimes what that means is that a human has to go through and look at this data. So of course, data in our world looks more like this spaghetti monster of uh, travel between different data sources and our data is dispersed between many different resources. The documentation is sometimes, you know, sparse or non-existent even. We have a lot of identifiers that um, represent the same kind of object. I mean, think of how many identifiers there are for a particular gene. Um, and, you know, the provenance between these data transformations is not necessarily clear. Uh, what this results in is at a micro level, we spend a lot of development time and money cleaning and structuring and restructuring data in order to interoperate. And at a macro level, we know that we're probably missing out on treatments for patients right at the center of this spaghetti um, or microbial effects on climate change. Any domain we look at, we're probably missing out on stuff just because we can't make our data fit together. <clears throat> and so getting to sort of like the, the outline of my talk, I'm gonna sort of focus on two endpoints of a data collection and distribution ecosystem. First, we have on the one side, annotating data consistently with sort of a standard group of terms and concepts. We talked earlier about ontologies. This is where I'm gonna talk about ontologies and how to do that. And on the other end, in the second part of my talk, I wanna see sort of how we can make implicit data models, these spreadsheets or these other kinds of implicit models we work with, really explicit with the LinkML framework. <clears throat> and I think the best way to see the concepts talking in this talk are really by example, but please give me a grain of salt and some grace because I am a software engineer and I'm making biological examples. So if they're too simplistic or uh, otherwise um, inconsistent, just give me some grace. I hope they uh, illustrate some of the foundational concepts of the modeling that I'm talking about rather than the biology. So I am from Oregon. That's on the West coast of the United States and we're next to an ocean. We have lots of lakes and rivers and mountains. 
Um, and so I made up these three particular fake sample data sets, one from Lake Albert, one from the Pacific Ocean, and one from Crater Lake. And these three different hypothetical researchers are looking at the bacterial compositions of, of biosamples in Oregon. And we have a fourth researcher that comes in afterwards and says, you know, um, excuse me, <clears throat> how can I use this data to my advantage? How can I compare the bacterial compositions of different bodies of water, maybe even from different parts of the bodies of water, maybe from the epipelagic zone, right? Uh, and as I understand it from my bio biology friends, that's the region of water that maybe the sun can penetrate. And, you know, she automatically looks at these three data sets and says, yes, I can tell by the titles here that probably it's data that I want to use, but I have to do a lot of like looking at this data manually to see not only whether or not the depth is consistent between all these data sets, but what the bacteria column actually means. And it's not clear to me yet, or this researcher as a data consumer if I can compare the data sets. And so the first thing that researcher has to do to codify her knowledge of the data set titles into, into uh, data that can be compared is to pull those titles into a single controlled vocabulary of sample types or sample location types. Um, and, and then you have to kind of ask yourself what makes what if we can say from the title that this is from a lake, right? But what does that mean? What does a lake mean? Is a puddle a lake? Is a backyard swimming pool a lake? You know, what does a lake mean? The same thing you could think of with, from a soil sample or a sand sample is sandbox sand, the same as beach sand is the same as river sand. We don't know. How do we disambiguate this? Can I see whether or not something is a freshwater lake versus a saltwater lake? And I'll tell you the secret here that Lake Albert in Oregon is a saltwater lake, but you don't tell that from the data set, right? Only the person consuming the data, gathering the data knows those details oftentimes about their data. And so having a common vocabulary here is really key. We wanna be able to extract the definition of a lake, extract the definition of an ocean, extract the definition of all these different types into a central repository where not only people downstream of us that are using our data that has been transformed in this way, can understand what we mean by lake, but also even people in our own group, right? So I want to make sure that my graduate student or my postdoc or whatever is annotating the data the same way I am. So I need to have definitions for what a lake and an ocean here is. And of course, as you all know, that's where ontologies come into play. Come into play. We have two really great places to look up terms that are used throughout biology, throughout our domain to represent different kinds of biomes right? Ontologies aren't just for biomes, of course, they're for everything from gene function all the way up to, uh, you know, chemical, uh, chemical composition of different things, processes, etc. But in pr this particular example, we can go to the ontology lookup service or bioportal, search for lake, and we see a concise definition of that term, how it's related to other terms, like whether or not a lake is a water body, or if it's a body of liquid, or if it's you know, a lentic water body, whatever that means, like I would have to go read the direction of the definition to figure out what that means. But it helps me understand the definition, points me to definitions, synonyms, cross-references, et cetera, that can harmonize the knowledge that I have about a lake, <clears throat> right? And so if the researcher in this example was to go a little bit further, she could explore the ontology and actually assign better terms than just lake or ocean to these, these sample data sets, she could um, assign actual ontology terms. Um, and that's great. In fact, you know, ex ex examining ENVO, this is the environment ontology in this example, a little bit further, we can see that even more to the point, there is a term for the marine photic zone, which, you know, is a part of that epipelagic region, probably, we could read the definition to make sure. Uh, and so we can actually get really close to her question just by annotating the data into the most um, specific ontology term we can find. Uh, one thing we noticed from the from examining this, or I guess I noticed from putting together these examples is that there's no freshwater photic zone in the environment ontology, but that's okay because we know ontologies are living standards and they should evolve. And that evolution is managed so that the downstream annotation that use these terms can be updated relatively painlessly. In particular, there's tools from the Obo Foundry, the Open Biomedi Biological and Biomedical Ontology resource that helps people migrate annotations from a data source to a particular ontology as that ontology changes, right? And so I guess the first thing I would do if I was looking for this freshwater photic zone would be to consult where Envo is hosted. I can find that on the Obo Foundry and then go directly to the GitHub repository that shows this standard in an open way, right? And I can make a ticket. And I can use my knowledge as a researcher of 
uh, photic zone bacteria to make a definition of that term. Uh, I might even get directed to the Oboe Foundry Slack and meet Nico, who is a great developer and uh, can help me if I need help with, with making those terms. I don't necessarily need to go create my own ontology, of course, I can reuse one that's already there. And then my knowledge is contributed to the greater understanding of this and, and we all smile and go on with our lives, right? And in fact, this is actually going really well. We have a lot of biomedical and biological ontologies that are being used to make thousands of annotations with high quality reusable components every year. And in fact, the ontologies in the Obo Foundry use each other and reuse these concepts, reuse this knowledge very well uh, between each other. So if I'm um, looking at a phenotype term from the human phenotype ontology, I can directly see how a chemical might be used to annotate that phenotype. Same thing with the gene ontology, maybe a particular cell term <clears throat> might need to be imported into the gene ontology to better classify a cellular location. We can do that. And that's due to a lot of work by the Oval Foundry to make lots of tools that, that help us interoperate. <clears throat> but I guess the second half of my talk is, our ontology is really enough though, right? If we look again at our example, we have a nice representation of the type of sample that we're taking, but really what's here is an implicit data model, right? We know that there is some co constraint that the researcher used to gather this data that allows them to understand what this bacteria column means or that the depth is always in cent centimeters in this data set and might be in inches or feet in this one, but we have no metadata along with this sample data set to know how to validate that, right? And how to make sure that something isn't a mistake or reuse or re we look at this data in a different context. So um, to complicate matters, of course, even if we had something, um, a data modeling framework, for example, that was more complex than a spreadsheet, it still may not be computable without human intervention. So if you look at like an SQL or relational database and you see these two data definition languages for the, for the sample, table, for example, one might even be called lake sample and the other one is just something more generic like bio sample. You'd still need a person to even just look at the table um, tables and make sure that they were the same. But more to the point, while we can specify that something is a float or uh, a string value, we can also specify whether or not that value is unique in terms of a primary key, right? We still might have some di disagreement. So in this sample, I'm saying that depth is really a foreign key. Maybe there's a controlled vocabulary table that says only these five depths are allowed and we have to do a pick list in this Crater Lake sample data set, whereas in the Pacific Ocean data set, the depth is a float, right? So the whole point of this slide is just to say that different data frameworks also have this issue where we it's hard to interoperate without a human. And you can think of JSON schema, right? JSON schema can have descriptions on every attribute, but it doesn't necessarily support a hierarchy of values like an ontology does. Right, or you can define a hierarchy in RDF, but it's more difficult to model a closed world where you're actually enforcing schemas to have values in their data sets that are, that are restricted, right? All of these things still kind of require a human. And depending on what kind of hat you wear uh, in a particular organization, it's not just a few of these languages. We have a wealth of different modeling language um, and the, the kind of technology that we're familiar with isn't necessarily the most easy for someone else who's familiar with another language to learn. There's a learning curve to all these stacks. And as biology evolves, so does technology. So ta technology you know, often evolves right out from under the application using it. And so we always have to keep in mind here that the insights right across the data sources are not only you know, in disparate data collection, but they're also being served with different tools. Um, and different technologies, and that there's real humans under here trying to trying to interpret that. So of course, the the joke's on me, right? If we have 15 or 14 uh, competing standards that are hard, as I've just said, to interoperate between, then clearly the situation is that we need another standard, right? <laughs> but 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 ultimately, we think that LinkML um, isn't just another standard; it's a bridging framework. So it's more like a universal converter box where we can democratize schema development into something that's very easy to do for lots of different people, from subject matter experts to technology experts, and also that almost uh, parasitizes these other frameworks to help us uh, convert 
between link the mail and uh, and another technology that you might be more familiar with. So what is link ML? Link ML again is the meta model, which is the data definition language or the, the language we use to describe uh, classes and slots and attributes and relationships between them in link ML. And it's also a set of tools that helps uh, technologists or, or gives programmatic access to a lot of friendly tools that help us validate data, compare data, enter data according to a schema, and even lift a model from one schema language to another. And at first, I just want to sort of look at the LinkML syntax in a short and clear way. So again, we're going back to my silly little software engineering <laughs> example here. I've added a few more columns to make it a little bit more real, but not too, not too real to, to confuse you or anything. But uh, so each of these, I think we can think of um, just from a very basic data modeling point of view, that each row of this data set uh, showed at the beginning here um, is an implicit model. And we can think of rows in the table like individuals of the same type of thing, all individuals of the Pacific Ocean sample data set. And the columns sort of define um, each of these characteristics of that. In LinkML, we call this grouping of individuals with same attributes, of course, classes like many other modeling languages. And each of those classes can have attributes which represent these column titles. But LinkML goes a little bit further like other modeling languages and allows you to specify a lot of metadata to go with that. So instead of just saying that, you know, this sample type, for example, is, uh, you know, text or a string, uh, what we can really say is that it's actually, the type is actually a query. Um, we can say that it's required, it can't be null. And we can say that it's constrained in LinkML by this concept of a, a, a dynamic enumeration. So with this simple syntax, we can say that for, for this data set, the sample type is reachable from an ontology, which is the Envo ontology that I showed. And so any value here must be, a, must be an ontology term, right? So easy to write a validator for that. Uh, LinkML loves ontologies in other ways, right? It doesn't just say whether or not a particular column or attribute is a string or if it's required or if it's multi-valued, but it can also link directly in an RDF serialization of the model to a particular ontology term that's defined outside the model. So this syntax here is saying that the depth attribute is actually, when serialized as RDF, the environment ontology term of this identifier. Uh, if we don't want to go that far and we just instead want to provide some mappings from our model to an existing ontology, we can use the SCOS framework uh, annotations in LinkML itself to say that you know this PADO term phenotype and a uh, phenotype and trait ontology term has an exact mapping of its definition and its place in the hierarchy to salinity, um, et cetera. <clears throat> and in fact, um, goodness, in fact, LinkML doesn't just reuse ontology terms, you can uh, reuse LinkML models from other people. So if I had these two data sample sets, a biosample from Lake Albert and a biosample from the Pacific Ocean, and they were actually talking together or they both had link ML models, we could actually import the Pacific Ocean data set biosample class definition into the lake sample uh, link ML model. And because link ML is hierarchical, we can say that the lake sample is a kind of biosample, which is a class from another model or with its own model. Uh, and we can reuse the attributes that we've defined on one class in another class, but also extend it to include things that only a lake sample has that a bio sample doesn't. And I know I've gone through that pretty quickly. There's a lot of other things in the syntax for LinkML that make it really extensible with lots of different kinds of data. So we just added support for multidimensional arrays. There's a rule syntax that allows you to include regular expressions in some of these constraining values. You could also um, make sort of complex rules that say, if the longitude is X, then the latitude must be from a per permissible value data set of Y, Z, and P. Um, I'd encourage you to take the tutorial. It's really great. We're also gonna be presenting at the ISMB conference this summer, um, a full day tutorial on the LinkML syntax if you wanna find out more information. The, Moving on sort of just quickly to the other half of the LinkML framework is the tools that we use to help us 
uh, move a LinkML model into some of these other existing frameworks. So you might have a bio curator, or a data scientist, or a technologist making these LinkML schemas in YAML. And then we have some simple command line tools that help you take that YAML and convert it into all these other syntaxes like JSON schema. We make Python data classes or Pydantic data classes. We can make SQL. We can make OWL, RDF. And so what we really try to do here is to allow people to use uh, a LinkML model in whatever framework that they're used to already. Right. And so if you think of it from a, like a micro level, again, if you're talking about a web application, you might have a link in a model that defines, you know, not only your, your, your relational data backend, but it could also be converted into TypeScript and you could use it in your front end. That that's the kind of an idea here. It also is like, if you're a JSON schema shop and you love JSON schema, but you have the new use case that you need to provide your data in RDF, well, you can convert your JSON schema into LinkML, LinkML can go to RDF, things like that. And I think it's, again, easiest to see what I mean by that by looking at examples. So in LinkML, you might have classes and slots. In SQL, you might have a create table statement with some <laughs> column definitions. In Python, you might have a data class, et cetera. JSON schema, you might have um, objects and, and properties. <clears throat> And so as I was saying, like we're not trying to recreate the wheel here. LinkML has built-in validators, so you can validate from the command line. It's a simple command. LinkML validate your schema against a, uh, both a, a schema linter, and also you can validate your data against a LinkML schema. But we really try to parasitize other frameworks. So one of the big things we do in LinkML in our default validator is convert a LinkML model to JSON schema, then use the built-in JSON schema validation to Re, to revalidate a particular set of data. Of course, we can extend that in LinkML and we can say, well, some of the things that maybe are supported in LinkML syntax that aren't supported in JSON schema, we can have plugin architecture to increase the validation of our LinkML model. But very simply, we can also just reuse uh, tool frames that already, tool chains that already exist. Another thing that we found really helpful for people as they've been adopting LinkML is that you know, having intelligent assistance from automatic schema tools has been really helpful. So you might have a spreadsheet, right, that that I've showed earlier that defines sort of this implicit model. Well, you can use the schema automator from LinkML to turn that into a LinkML schema based on some of just the metadata in the in the spreadsheet. You can also convert from JSON schema. Of course, that's a lot easier. There's JSON schema is more rich syntax than, of course, a TSV file is. Um, you can also convert from OWL. Um, and all of these things are just to try to help people come to a centralized framework where many people in your organization can use the same language. Um, LinkML also auto-generates documentation. So if you've defined a class with attributes in LinkML, again, just a command line, easy command line command, and you can generate a GitHub pages documentation framework with all of the rich annotations you've done on your model displayed publicly and openly for people to look at. We also generate UML diagrams in lots of different formats like Mermaid, or um, I think there's a plant UML, uh, UML generator. And you can kind of see the relationships between your classes. And I think this is a really underappreciated, um, uh, you know, uh, for models in general. You know, after spending a lot of time working with SQL and looking at Schema Spy and all sorts of different things for being able to visualize a model when you're first getting to know it, I think documentation is really undervalued, and I think a lot of the schema frameworks don't have that built in. And so for LinkML, you can kind of go to a single documentation source on the web, deployed by GitHub Action pretty easily, and see your, your schema completely documented. Um, another sort of lessons we've learned over the last couple of years um, in sort of like the rapid adoption of LinkML outside of our own particular use cases for a wider variety of data is that um, really models need to use examples forward design. So there's a framework in LinkML where you can put in the example data that is, you know, matching your schema, run it through several tests and, you know, allow people to see that your test data is passing your schema, which seems like a very obvious and simple thing to do, but it's not available in a lot of different modeling frameworks. So we have an entire, um, you know, uh, effort to put together example data that helps explain the model to people in your community. And you can use that also to run tests. 
there's a lot of additional features, probably don't have time to go through all of them. Again, I would encourage you to take the tutorial. Lincoln also has a project generation cookie cutter, which is kind of just like a templating system that allows you to set up, you know, your directory structure and your YAML file in the place where a lot of these tools expect it to be. In a particular repository, it also comes with GitHub Actions that allow you to push your generated documentation directly to GitHub um, automatically. And it you know, comes with the linter and the validator and things. And you can look at the cookie cutter on the, the link here I provided you. And I just encourage you to you know, give us feedback if it came out the way you were expecting it to. Um, it's a really nice thing and I use it almost every week. So looking forward, LinkML is in active development, right? Um, we have, uh, this is actually probably old news by now. Uh, we developed this over the course of last summer, I believe. But you can feed a LinkML schema into a large language model. You can, um, you know, ask it to extract text according to the LinkML model from a variety of different like published sources. We have several tools for this. If you want to, could probably do a whole conversation about LLMs and schemas and extracting text. But there's a couple of links to tools here um, to do that work. And then the other thing that's really in active development right now is that in other frameworks like um, relational databases, there's tools like Flyway or Liquibase that allow you to iterate on your model and they provide tooling to help you migrate data according to the model changes. And I think this is another really undervalued bit of work that people need to remember when they're making a model is like, you're never gonna make a model for your data that is stagnant. Biology isn't stagnant, you know, Everybody, all of our understandings of how data fits together changes and building iteration into our models from the start is probably a really good thing for all of our architectures. We don't wanna get in a situation where we can't change our models. <laughs> so LinkML is really putting together right now a working group to look at a transformation framework. This means transforming not only just um, a change log of schema changes, for example, but also taking a really highly normalized model or one that has a lot of no redundancy between its classes and its attributes and making a flat model for easy searching, right? So sort of condensing a lot of those joins or a lot of those subclasses into a single flat class. It's another use case for our iteration called um, LinkML Transformer tool. And then it also gives you a framework to think about extending models. So another thing we've seen from this rapid adoption of LinkML is that people in our biological space tend to model the same thing over and over again, but with slightly different attributes. So a gene model, for example, <laughs> in a genetics lab or a genetics data set generation um, organization might be slightly different than one that is being used to express um, you know, the, the microbiome of a particular biome, right? There, there are different attributes that you wanna capture that gene might have different relationships. And another way with this link of Mel Transformer is planning to be used is to be able to transform um, and extend one model into another or subset it. So I was mentioning before that we've had a sort of a surprising amount of adoption of LinkML over the last couple of years. There's a whole lot of people using it. Um, we've just gotten, we just had two great hackathons with the Neurodata Without Borders folks and the uh, neurology community as well as the microbiome and the um, genetics communities with the Alliance of Genome Resources and the medical community with the NCATS Data Translator Project. So there's also a couple of people in our community calls from like the, the Belgium Railway, Associ uh, Railway Association. So we're really getting a lot of people understanding this need for a common modeling framework that can be distributed a lot of different ways. Um, and what we really wanna do is encourage everyone to come and join us, right? So we host a monthly community meeting uh, on Zoom. So you can come and bring your questions about LinkML. We also have presentations from the community, uh, kind of like this, I, I would say, um, and also tutorials, right? So if we have a new tool like the OntoGPT tool, which you know uh, uses LinkML models to extract text via LLMs, from published literature, we'll give a tutorial on that. We also have a Slack channel and a mail list. We'd love for you to join. Probably the easiest way is just to reach out to me. I do a lot of the community coordination for that, but of course you can find us on the Oboe Foundry Slack as well. And um, there's tons of people working on this. So these are a couple of the people 
that are you know working on it from the lab and from the uh, University of Colorado, which is our our big collaborators. But we also have a whole lot of open source developers. I can't even name them all. So we we're happy for contributions. We're happy for change logs. We're happy for um, you to join us. So I, I really appreciate the time to talk, and I and I'll be happy to take some questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah, for this wonderful talk about the technical details of Flink ML, the language itself, and also the characteristics of it as kind of universal convert box. It's a really good talk. I see Ruth just raise her hand. Yeah. Um, so Sierra, um, I finally did figure out why I know your face, and it is because <laughs> you are in the Oboe Foundry. Yes. And um, and so I've been spending a lot of time over there. Uh, the issue I have is, um, and this isn't specifically Link ML um, related; it's more Obo Foundry related. I mean, the Obo Foundry is great. I mean, I love the uh, you know the uh, the toolkit and robot and all of those things. In fact, I use them all the time. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it they, you know i'm not sure how eager or as far as i can tell none of these people really would like to have things like rocks and soil and you know oh. um real earth science stuff polluting their <laughs> medical and biological uh system that works so well <laughs> um and which is one of the reasons why ESIP has this thing called core, for example. Yes, I saw that. Um, because you, uh, Brandon, who is uh, not on the on the call today, but he's he's actually in um, New Zealand. Um, had put together a list of about oh I don't know a few hundred earth science related ontologies that had been developed over the years almost none of which were actually accessible by anybody for reusing for any purpose whatsoever. And, and so that was one of the emphases for court to get developed, but it would be cool if we could get all of science together and, you know, maybe extend the terminology. So it's not just bio, um, over there in the Oboe Foundry. Um, and I was trying to get that pushed a little bit. I was getting a heck of a lot of pushback from people like Chris and you name oh, yeah. it. Well, um, that, that's too bad because I feel like the, the Oboe Foundry is one of those organizations that, um, you know, has a lot of expertise in developing ontologies and maybe that expertise has made them shy, right? Like it's, it takes a lot of, and you probably know this very, very well. It takes a lot of work and a lot of resources to make a good ontology, right? And yes. that's by doing it and that you're using these tools to help you infer over all the relationships you're creating, the axioms, et cetera. And all of that work at the Oboe Foundry is voluntary. And so I think it's like, um, number one, I think they would, I'll do my best to help you, but I think they should welcome experts from different fields. Like if we have this resource that is claiming to be very open and it's claiming to be very um, indicative of all the best practices in making ontology, then one of those best practices is being very open to understanding different kinds of domains of science. And so I, I'm happy to talk to you offline or figure out how we can get that going. But I also noticed that you do have a lot of ontologies from earth science already. Right. And they aren't open. And so how do we how do we develop a community around that? And then maybe that's what you guys are doing here. Right. Is well, developing that's what we're trying and not particularly succeeding at. <laughs> um, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it is standard. true that I actually I do contribute to Envo a lot. Oh, nice. Excellent. Um, it's probably got a few hundred terms for me in it. But <laughs> and yes, I do know like Nico really pretty well and yeah. and um etc uh but um but you know trying to push them to broaden the scope of things like instruments and absolutely and stuff like that has been a really heavy lift 
I don't know um, they're going through a transition to. I think they've uh, established a new governance body. Um, so yeah, they're, trying, yeah. they're trying. It just it's a slow process. You know, this is like the knowledge representation, right? It's you're trying to use make something that's is going to be very reusable throughout all of these different fields, and it's you know you know it's hard. <laughs> Yes, no, I understand completely, um, which is why I, you know, I'm trying to, you know, make sure that core doesn't doesn't die because yeah. that's all we've got at the moment. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but anything we could do to try and get to the point <laughs> where earth science is as well organized as uh, bio and medicine is uh, would be really lovely, I think, because until we get to that point, we're going to have huge problems, you know, taking snow pits from here and over in China and over in Russia and other places around the world and doing anything meaningful with them on a global scale. It's just horrible. <clears throat> so anyway, sorry. That's a rant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see uh, Joshin paste their question in the chat. Do you want to talk about it? Or I can read it for you. Yeah, no, no, I just was reading it, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is this, there is a LinkML um, tool called the Schema Automator. And I would consider the Schema Automator like a bootstrapping tool similar to a cookie cutter. Of course, it's not creating the project for you, it's creating the schema for you. But there's, of course, cleaning that you probably have to do once you get that LinkML model um, generated from the spreadsheet, because probably the spreadsheet doesn't have as much metadata as you need to make that model. But it does get you started. And I would say that, you know, once you can see how a data set you're very familiar with translates into LinkML, whether that's LinkML YAML or SQL or JSON schema, it can really help you convey those ideas to the other people in your group, right? So that they can help you write that schema more directly. So it doesn't necessarily clean data for you. It doesn't necessarily like make a perfect model out of that spreadsheet, but it does give you a bootstrap to something more expressive. <clears throat> I think there's uh, another question, which is above oh. Ji Yin Zhang's one okay, sorry. from Jia Xun. I think what he means is the comparison between BioPortal and uh, DBPDI or Wikidata, those general ontology repositories or linked data repositories. And then are you suggesting for those really domain specific ontology repositories, do we need uh, like a professional editor? for the curation or yearly terminology so, and the definition. I yeah. totally understand. And I'm gonna answer that two different ways. One, I think I think it's always very helpful to have someone who's intimately familiar with a particular domain helping to contribute to the knowledge that you're formalizing in an ontology. But the other half of that is that if you look at the development of ontologies over time, sometimes semantic engineers don't necessarily have the expertise in the biology, but they have the expertise in the OWL format or in the ontology development itself, the semantic tools that go along with it. And sometimes that expertise can be just as valuable as the biology or as the earth science, whatever the case may be. And so I think there's room for absolutely collaboration between the two professional fields there. But also we have people from just the community that know a lot about a particular Thing. When you're talking about ontology, it could be anything from, like I said, from the smallest molecule to the, you know, the sky, whatever it is. So there are people that are just from the community that can contribute to this. And I think if you have an ontology that's set up that's open, it has tools like validators behind it. It has tools to help you infer relationships between the axioms that are suggested by anyone. You can definitely constrain, um, you can be confident in having more than just professional editors and developers make terms, right? You can you can confirm that what they're adding is not going to break the rest of the ontology, or you can confirm that what they're adding is is consistent with the, the branching structure that you have in your ontology, et cetera. So I think you if you would look, you'd find that lots of even experts in a particular field, like a zebrafish geneticist might be contributing to a human disease ontology, and that's totally fine because they understand how the ontology works and what makes a good term and all of that, so. Yeah. yeah, I think I also have a very simple kind of follow-up question. Mm -hmm. In one of your slides, you mentioned in the implementation of LinkML, 
one kind of direction or mechanism is LinkML model plus a tool shoot. I think the tool shoot you or shoot you mentioned is like we could we can use any like programming language or any existing tools just as a way to show the value of the link ML model we built in data integration, data cleansing, or even reasoning or data converting or data format converting. Is that what you mean? I think so. I did a shoot, is that what you said? The tool I shoot. The link the ML model plus tool shoot. Tool shoot. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but, but, but maybe maybe this one. Let me show maybe show me share my screen one more time. This guy, where you could kind of use a LinkML model to show mm -hmm. how it looks in different formats, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and honestly, I find this. I'm I'm not sorry. I'm trying. I'm probably not answering your question, but I find this very helpful for if you have a team that's really used to Owl. Showing them how LinkML looks in Owl first can help them understand how it looks in JSON schema, how it looks in Java, how it looks in Python. So I, I think that's, you know, even just as a communication tool, it's nice to be able to speak the same language as other people. Yeah. Okay. okay, we still have questions. Uh, oh, sorry, we still have time for uh, one or two questions. Anyone? Okay, otherwise, yeah, I will see. Thank you, Sarah, again for this uh, wonderful talk and all those details about LinkML and uh, the potential reusage of it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. Reach out if you'd like to be part of our, our community meetings. We'd love to have you and learn more about our science as well. Yeah. Oh, Jean, uh, you, can, you can stop recording. <laughs>